الحمد لله الحمد لله استماما لنعمته واستسلاما لعزته واستعين من نقصي إلى كفايته وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما For the next couple of khutbas, inshallah, I want to return to the most basic topic, which is prayer. And I know we often talk about prayer. I, I hope, inshallah, I can tackle it from a slightly different angle. And I would like to focus on the challenge of maintaining our prayers in our society and the bigger challenge of transmitting that habit to our children. How do we do that? And I would like to talk in two different realms, theory and practice. Things we teach our children and then things we do with them or show them. And what I have found, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, is that in this topic, children are like locks. And each lock has its own key. I've raised three children. I've watched a lot of other children grow up. And my experience, at least, has been that there isn't one master key that opens that lock for every young person. We have to try to find what works, what inspires that particular individual. So I'd like to try to share a few strategies. In terms of theory, there's a knowledge base about the significance of prayer in Islam. And I know we know this, but I'd like to just review it for the sake of remembrance. So, for example, we can talk about Surah Al-Mu'minun that is listing the characteristics of the believers. And some people have referred to this as sort of the Ten Commandments of Islam, if you will. And it begins by talking about prayer in that list and ends by talking about prayer in that list. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد أفلح المؤمنون الذين هم في صلاتهم خاشعون that the believers will attain to success. Who are they? What are their defining characteristics? الذين هم في صلاتهم خاشعون those who are humble and God-conscious in their prayers. And then the list continues on, talking about purification, talking about guarding one's private parts and, and um, not taking sexual license, talking about being true to your word, talking about uh, these various, very, very important characteristics. And then ends that list, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَوَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ um, that those who protect their prayers so that the list begins with those who are humble in their prayers and the list ends that those who protect the prayer they keep the prayer they guard the prayer um, and, and that is the defining beginning and end of the characteristics of the believers. And um, the, um, the theory there is that when the Prophet says that Islam has been built on five, that prayer is a main pillar or the main pillar in terms of the act of worship and remembrance. And so that's why the Quran comes and tells us that it has to be protected and guarded. So for example in Surah Al-Baqarah, That guard strictly your habit of prayer, especially the middle prayer and stand before Allah devout. So we're told, guard those prayers. Don't let life encroach on it. Don't let things get too busy or too out of hand that we are unable then to manage the prayer. That that prayer has to be the big rock. We guard it. We, we keep it safe like a baby. And then everything else gets built and put in around it. Now that's 
for us, for our personal practice. Then we're told that this is so important that it's too important not to share and not to push on and not to try to teach and enjoin over and over. And so the Quran then tells us that we should take some responsibility for what happens within our family. And so in Surah Taha, the Quran says, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا That enjoin the prayer on your family and persevere in this. Don't, you know, just hope that it's going to happen or don't once just say, oh, you know, you should pray. And it was the habit of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu that he would wake up his family for prayer and he would tell them, that I have been ordered to do this. And he would recite this verse. وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا And so when we're raising kids, we know that there's often a lot of pushback. That there's, you know, rolling of the eyes and why are you bothering me and why are you doing this and why are you doing that. And I know when I was raising my kids and I would get that, I would recite this verse and I'd tell them, I've been ordered to enjoin the prayer upon you. I can't just leave it as a light matter. And that it brings structure to life. And that that structure is very important. We don't stray too far in a day without remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why prayer is a timely obligation. I don't just pray whenever I have some free time that I just sit down and remember Allah. We do that as well. But again, the prayer is central and it forces a routine where we can't go too many hours without remembering that this life is a test, that we will be judged, how we treat other people, how we treat our families, how we interact with society, and how we recognize our relationship with the divine. And so the Quran is telling us in Salata Kanat Al Mu'minina Kitab and Mawkuta in Surah An Nisa that prayer is a timely obligation on the believers, not in spare time. Now I can sit down a little bit and, and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We make the time. And why is that? Because it is a refuge for us. It saves us from the stormy winds of life and the difficulties. And so we can teach our children that you will face tests and trials and anxieties. Anybody growing up as a teenager with all of the bullying and all of the cliques at school and all of the... It, it is difficult to be a young person, difficult to be an old person. And so, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ that in Surah Al-Baqarah, seek refuge, seek God's help in patience and in prayer. And then the Quran recognizes, and this is important to communicate to our kids, that we're not trying to pretend that this is small or easy. The Quran itself is saying, وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ It is a weighty task, except for those who are truly humble before their Lord. And, Again, that refuge isn't just a psychological refuge to make us feel better. That's important to give us peace and give us some serenity. But it also has very practical significance in keeping us out of harm's way in terms of falling into evil. And so the Quran is telling us in Surah Al-Ankabut, وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَى عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرُ وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ that Establish regular prayers because prayer restrains from sin and from all evil, all of the loathsome evil, the terrible things. The prayer is the shield because if you're praying five times a day, it's hard to really get into real bad stuff. I mean, you're going to be doing real bad stuff. Say, oh, okay, now I have to pray though. Please excuse me. No, you, that, that won't happen. You won't be at a drinking party and then say, oh, well, excuse me for a minute, I'm going to stop drinking now because it's time for me to go pray, you know, Maghrib. The prayer, that habit, will restrain us from evil. And then finally, what happens to those who skip their prayers? 
And we can see that in Surah Al-Muddathir, where the believers, there's a, a dialogue, sort of the, the metaphor of a, a dialogue in the hereafter between the people of heaven and the people of hell, and the people of heaven are asking the inmates of hell, مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ What brought you to hellfire? And their first answer, they said, we weren't among those who were prayerful. We were not among those who prayed. And we did not feed the poor. And we would indulge with the indulgers. Now these may seem like separate sins, but I think, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, that they're related. It's not that they're just completely unrelated things. We did this and this and this. The chain reaction began with leaving the prayer. And then because we were not among those who prayed, we just saw the verse from Surah Al-Ankabut that is telling us that prayer restrains us from evil. But because we didn't have that habit, then we did not establish this notion of God consciousness that we will be asked. So we didn't care about the poor and we didn't care to use our time well or to restrain ourselves from you know whatever may come our way that me, we may want to indulge in and people around us are indulging in the lack of prayer began that entire cascade that ends in a a, a room if you will in in hell and then in terms of these are some verses from the quran in terms of hadiths there are, you know, of course, so many hadiths, but let me just pick a couple, because each makes a point. And um, one that I, I like very much, and I, I would rehearse over and over with my kids, is the Prophet saying that this is going to be the first thing we're going to be asked about. And the hadith says, أَوَّلُ مَا يُحَاسَبُ عَلَيْهِ الْعَبْدُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ الصَّلَاةِ فَإِنْ صَلُحَتْ صَلُحَ سَائِرُ عَمَلِهِ وَإِنْ فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ سَائِرُ عَمَلِهِ uh, That's in the collection of At-Tabarani. That the first thing that the person will be called to account for on the Day of Judgment is his prayers or her prayers. If they are good, the rest of his deeds will be good. If he has succeeded in that, the rest of his deeds, inshallah, will be good. And that's again because of that effect of prayer. And if this has been a failure, so will everything else be a failure. And so I tell my kids, imagine you're taking a test at school. You don't want to stumble on the first question. You don't want the first question you're asked and it, it, you, know, you, you, you get it wrong. You want to begin, inshallah, on a good note. So if this is the first thing you're going to be asked about, that underscores its importance. And you don't want to start that, a test that way. And that it is the final thread. No matter what happens, we will all make mistakes, we will all sin, faith goes up, faith goes down, but that this is the lifeline that you will have that can draw you back. And the hadith of the Prophet that لَتُنْقَضَنَّ عُرَى الْإِسْلَامِ عُرْوَةٌ عُرْوَةٌ فَكُلَّ مَنْ تَغَضَتْ عُرْوَةٌ تَشَبَّثَ النَّاسُ بِالَّتِي تَلِيهَا فَأَوَّلَهُنَّ نَقْضَنُ الْحُكْمُ وَآخِرُهُنَّ الصَّلَاةِ that the fasteners or the ties of Islam will come undone one by one when Islam is getting lost. And every time one of them gets undone, people will grab onto the one below it. The first one to get undone is governance. The political system may then become corrupt. The last one to become undone is the prayer. That's the last foothold, the last line of defense. And when that gets undone, that's it. And so, that would be sort of in, in the realm of theory. I say what I have said. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me and to forgive you. Udu Allah. Alhamdulillah. Thumma alhamdulillah. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu anna muhammadan rasulullah. So we see, again, if we return to Surah Al-Mu'minun, we said it begins with prayer. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ And then it ends that وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَى صَلَوَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ That list, those who guard their prayers. So now let's talk a little bit about practice.
How do we guard that prayer? How do we keep it safe from intrusion? Well, you know, I've talked to a lot of parents and gotten a lot of good ideas. I think one very important idea, of course, which is obvious, is our own practice at home. Kids need to see us pray. It needs to be a habit. Secondly, it's good for them to see us schedule activities around prayer. We want to go see this movie? No, 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 this is going to interfere with us. We're going to see a later show. We're going to take a trip, a long drive. Okay, where are we going to pray? Let's see where the nearest Islamic center is. We're booking a plane. Okay. Are we going to pray sitting down on the plane, or are we going to have a layover that we're going to pray together at the airport? All of those, and all of a sudden, then that builds into children that the prayer comes first and we schedule life around it. These are very practical things. Thirdly, another wonderful idea is when we transition our kids out of Islamic school, or if they're not in Islamic school, we don't, Allah, we don't just Tell them, okay, now make sure you say your prayers. That's hard. That, that's almost insurmountable. We go with them to the new school. We meet the principal. We say we're Muslims. We pray five times a day. My child needs a safe space to pray. Can you please show me where that is? And who is going to be there to, to, to keep it safe for them? Right? These are very, very um, practical steps that we should not neglect. And as I said, um, we have to embrace the notion that the um, kids are sort of, as I said, like, uh, like locks. What is going to unlock this particular child? So for example, if none of the things that I've mentioned worked, if it's not the threat of hell or this or that, maybe it's the Prophet's hadith that when he was asked, Ayyul amal afdal? Ayyul amali afdal, ya Rasulullah? What is the best thing I can do? He said, Iqamatu salati li waqtiha. Say the prayer at its time. Then what? Then birrul walidain. Be good to your parents. Then what? Al jihadu fi sabilillah. Um, And, and that may inspire them. And as I said, you know, a lot of people do try, and sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail. It's in God's hands. But I think what we will be asked about is, did we try? And so I think that this notion of practice and the importance seeps in from what we do and from what we tell them also about the practice of others. I talked about the theory, but let's look at, at the practice of others. Things that somehow don't seem to get emphasized in the stories of the Prophet, the stories of the Khulafa. So we've all heard about the story of the death of the Prophet I think it should be much more <laughs> emphasized that when he got sick, and too sick to lead the prayers, what was a real priority to him was what's going to happen. So he said, Muru Abu Bakrin, Tell Abu Bakr that he needs to lead the prayers. And Aisha, his wife, Radiallahu Anha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, objected. She said, You know, he, he's a man who weeps too much in his prayer and his voice doesn't carry. And, and, and the Prophet said, Tell Abu Bakr he will lead the prayers. And she objected again. And the Prophet said, Tell Abu Bakr he will lead the prayers. And he insisted. And so they told Abu Bakr, and Abu Bakr led the prayers. Um, now, when Umar ibn al Khattab, and I, I told you his practice was to wake up his family for prayers. It wasn't just to wake up his family. It was actually to be first at the mosque, at the masjid, and wake up the Muslims for Fajr prayer. And it was one such morning where he got stabbed by Abu Lu'la. And that was the, the stabbing that in a couple of days resulted in his death. And so... What happened when he gets stabbed? This is just before Fajr prayer. He's stabbed, he's bleeding out. People come in, they crowd around. Umar ibn al-Khattab has been stabbed. They carry him to his house, and he's, he's bleeding out. So what is on his mind? 
says Umur Abdul Rahman ibn Awf al yusalli bin nas tell Abdul Rahman ibn Awf he needs to lead the prayer he's worried about what's going to happen if he's not there to lead the prayer are the people going to pray and then he passes out he becomes unconscious and when he wakes up first thing he says hal sallad nas did the people pray not what's happening with me, or am I going to live, am I going to die? He, he talked about who was it that stabbed me afterwards. But the first thing he says, Hal sallan nas, did the people pray? And they told him, yes, they did pray. And so he said, La hadla fil islam liman taraka salah. That there is no good fortune in Islam for he who leaves the prayer. And then he asked for a basin, and he did his wudu, and he prayed his fajr. Now, to me, the interesting thing is that this isn't found in a chapter on the importance of prayer. This is found in fiqh books on that does blood on your clothes break your wudu or not? And then we're reflecting that well, Umar ibn Khattab, well, he had blood on his clothes, he was bleeding, and he just did his wudu and he prayed and so on. And that's fine, we can have that juristic debate. But to me, this is a teaching moment for my kids about the importance of prayer that this man is stabbed and mortally wounded and he wants to make sure that he has delegated the prayer and he, he goes unconscious, he wakes up and he says, did they pray? And when people learn that stuff, it affects their behavior. So when my father, God rest his soul, got his diagnosis of cancer and I in fact was the one who gave him the diagnosis and told him that it was inoperable, and he said, okay, then that's it. And so I said, can I do something for you? And he said, keep me clean and make sure I say my prayers. And to the best of my knowledge, and I was with him when he died, he died, alhamdulillah, with his prayers complete. My uncle went into a coma for several days. And so his daughter, my cousin Iba, said, his prayers and her prayers. So she would do two duhr, two asr, etc. One for her, one for him. Now I'm not trying to give anybody the impression that this is an Islamic obligation. I don't want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having loaded people with something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not loaded them with. But it is just symbolic of how she had grown up that this prayer is so important that just like the Prophet taught that if your parent intended to do Hajj and then dies before doing Hajj, you take that obligation. She carried it over, and again this is not a general obligation, this was her personal choice, a symbolic choice, that she wanted her father's prayers complete. So she prayed his prayers until he died. And of course, the, the last thing I want to share, and when I asked my daughter, what was it that made you keep your prayers? Which of these things? Trying to learn, trying to understand. Is it this? Is it no, 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 no. None of this. So I said, then what? She said, I remember you telling us, and again, this is very difficult to find in the books of Sierra that this was the Prophet's last breath recommendation. That as he was dying, Anas ibn Malik recounts, and you can find this in Muhammad al-Ghazali's Seerah of the Prophet, um, that he kept repeating, The prayers, the prayers, and what your right hand possesses. Meaning, in today's world, I guess, those that you are responsible for. And he kept repeating it, and Anas is describing, He kept repeating it until his chest was gurgling, and his tongue couldn't make the words out any more clearly, but he just kept telling the Muslims, his last breath, and that was the key for her, alhamdulillah. That among everything I tried, I, I got lucky, I got blessed. And one of the keys worked, and that's what she took away, and that's what worked. And so we try, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is the blesser of those efforts. 
and our prayer رَبِّ جَعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ رَبَّنَا وَتَقَبَّلْ دُعَى As in Surah Ibrahim, My Lord, make me among those who establishes prayer, and from my descendants, Lord, please accept my, my supplication to you. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and our children. اللهم اجعل القرآن شفاء لصدورنا وربيع قلوبنا ومنبع إيماننا وزكاة لنفوسنا وجلاء همنا ونور قبورنا وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين أقم الصلاة